With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom, reach new audiences, and bring important information to the public free of charge. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom and donate today. Simply go to tntradio.live. You're with Bruce DeTorres and World Stage on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. World Stage indeed, exposing the tyrannies and exploring our power. I am Bruce DeTorres. And when I was a kid in school, in front of the classroom, above the chalkboard, there was an American flag. And on one side was a little portrait of George Washington, and on the other, Abraham Lincoln. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. My memory is all through grade school up until sixth grade. Maybe maybe they were even in junior high and high school. And Lincoln became one of my earliest heroes. And I read uh, all I could about him, starting very, very young. In the first grade, a teacher said, you're a good reader. Oh, I'm a good reader was my first identity, really. And Lincoln was shot on April 14th. Yesterday was the anniversary of that. It also happened to be a Friday. And I continued to read American history, much about the presidents, and then did a deep dive starting in 2004 when I was encouraged to study 9-11 and continually read about Lincoln among many, many, many others. And in the last couple of years, uh, I've had a real uh, discovery through uh, a historian uh, and teacher named Matthew Errett, who referred me to my next guest, whose articles I had read, whose one of his books in the past I had read. And I'm talking about Anton Chaitkin, who is an historian and investigative journalist who's made groundbreaking discoveries about the lives and intentions of those who fought for man's improvement and about their imperial opponents. Anton's 1985 book, Treason in America, from Aaron Burr to Avril Harriman, documented the takeover of U.S. policymaking by agents and allies of the British Empire. Anton co-authored George Bush, Bush, the unauthorized biography, the only serious biography of Bush Sr., which helped defeat him in his 1992 re-election attempt. And Anton's most recent book is Who We Are, America's Fight for Universal Progress, from Franklin to Kennedy. Volume 1 came out a couple of years ago, 1750s to 1850s, and it reveals the strategic reality Behind America's Founding and Our National Mission of Progress. Volumes two and three will continue the story from Abraham Lincoln to Franklin Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy, showing America's astonishing contributions to humanity when governed by a philosophy opposite to today's murderous globalism. Thank you very much for joining me today, Anton. How are you? Hello. Good to be with you. Bruce. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to I want to read a little bit more about you to begin with here. This is from your site, whowearebook.com. That's whowearebook.com. Anton Chaitkin has been an activist since his childhood in the 1950s. In the early 1930s, his father, Jacob Chaitkin, a pro-Franklin Roosevelt lawyer, had blocked some of Wall Street's financial arrangements with Hitler and was legal counsel for the American Jewish Congress boycott against Germany. Anton grew up committed to justice with a strong sense of the realities of power politics. About two years after the JFK assassination, Chaitkin heard from Lyndon LaRouche that financers were shifting American strategy away from industrial progress toward cheap labor foreshadowing fascist policies and systemic collapse. An association was formed to defeat, to defeat those who had brutalized contemporary thought in science, economics, the arts, and philosophy. So, Anton, now hearing all that and putting all that on the, on the table, um, I, I, I consider the history you reveal about America's founding, especially as I'm, I'm well into who we are, um, your book, 
it's I almost I could almost contrast kind of you know what might be the mainstream understanding of the founding now very watered down and distorted about oh those almost those evil white men it was you know they just were selfish blah 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 the founders I'm talking about versus the reality so I want to let you pick up from all this that I've just described to you so um you know, you could you could start you know teaching or augmenting or you know fleshing out what what you know everything that I just shared, and then you know I can ask them specific questions. Does is that did I give you enough handles there to choose from? <laughs> yes, yeah, plenty. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have been working for several decades. Uh, I just had my 80th birthday, so you, that sort wow. of. Tells you what generation I'm from. Born in '43. Happy birthday! Wow. Thank you. Um, and I I have became a specialist in a particular current of thought and action in our history, and that is uh, people who who believed in and and fought for and actually organized the the means to get progress. For everybody, uh, these were Amer uh, uh, in 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 studying the American side of this. I did study other countries as well, but the American side. These were American nationalists. Uh, the primary founders of the country were were nationalists of this kind, and they were not chauvinists. That is, they they believed that other countries sister nations should also be free of imperial control and should also become powerful alongside America as America rose in power. And how do we rise? Primarily by industrialization. That is by gaining powers uh, and, and skills in the population and in capital investment uh, and in new science and new technology. Uh, that gives us the power to uh, break from the domination of a, an imperial trade system. On the other side uh, is the, uh, in our history, are the uh, usually pro-British, British-aligned financiers uh, who are based in uh, Boston and uh, New York, and London, and also a couple of other places in Europe, Geneva and Amsterdam. So this is the, the basis of the um, Eastern establishment. But our country was founded by, let's, let's name three of the founders who are in the faction that I've been studying and, and working on, uh, Washington, Hamilton, and Franklin. Uh, I, I documented in my book uh, Franklin's role in uh, England, where he, where he was for 18 years before the uh, revolution, where he helped Englishmen who were who believed in uh, progress, not the Empire faction, to make their industrial revolution there. And then the, the British Empire decided, okay, we have the steam engine, we have canals, we have power. From, from this progress, we're not going to let any other country get these powers. No other country be, should be permitted to have manufacturing and to be become a powerful modern country. So we had a revolution with that reality as, as uh, pressing upon us that the British had this power, not just, you know, cannons, not just uh, their, their control over India or Ireland and other places. But they, they had this power over nature. We had to get that. And that's the basis of the fight over our policy between people who wanted to build up the United States, like Hamilton originally, versus Jefferson, who was in the free trade and, and sort of feudalist kind of southern uh, British-linked uh, uh, way of life. Uh, we industrialized to begin with uh, late, much later than the British, because we had to fight for this, for, for our government to back 
industrialization. So we we had that in the 1820s. Uh, and then I, I that, that's all in the first volume of the book. Mm. The people who made the uh, inventions and who ha- pushed the government policy that built the canals and the railroads in the United States, uh, though the people who actually industrialized the country were the protectionists, the nationalists. Wall Street grew up as a as a broker for the slave south and as a broker for importing of british uh manufacturers they were anti-national wall street and london financiers never built any industry people have to understand that in our in our background uh i guess we'll get back to that but they Hmm. this is this is a very important uh, thing to understand so when you mm-hmm. when you rebel against industry or against technology or uh, you know against uh, uh, cities against uh, 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 you know nuclear energy or some powerful form of energy steel making if you revolt against these things because you're revolting against the establishment you're in a trap you're in mm-hmm. a mental trap that's been su- supplied to you by this establishment so uh, Hmm. i've been recently working on volume two uh which will be in the 19th century focusing on the lincoln era and this this uh set of leaders uh Mm -hmm. they're based in philadelphia largely during this period uh they they involve some industrialists and some scientists a, a political and, and philosophical leader named Henry Carey, uh, associated with the Lincoln faction. Uh, and they're up against another faction that's in Boston and New York. Uh, and this, I, I, I'm just recently been working very intensively on the period through and after the Civil War when we had reconstruction of the South. And I, I, I've got a, a, a totally new story about what was going on then that I thought it would be very interesting to share with listeners. Uh, this relates to how, and I think can help guide us out of the danger that we are presently in, the danger heading towards world war, the danger of, of civilization being dis- ruined and, or destroyed. Anton, uh, before you before you describe that, I want to tell you how powerful I'm finding, you know, volume one of who we are. Good. Talking about um ju- for instance, just up to page sixty-four, this is this is one of the most exciting books that I have read in a long, long time because you describe how Benjamin Franklin inspired colleagues attracted uh, smart good-hearted um people around him really wherever he went it seems and that's right he was yeah. he was the he was the, the the strongest catalyst to that that free inquiry that would let inventors and engineers um make giant strides in technology. And as you described, he was in England in the 1760s and 1770s, maybe it was the 1750s and 60s, where lo and behold, very quickly, English uh, engineers created, perfected a steam engine that allowed them to build those kind of canals and kind of talk the local government or even parliament into allowing um, canals to be built so that coal could be brought from the mountains that it was in to Manchester, for example, and how quickly uh, the cost of living went down, well-paying jobs were being created, and how Franklin and his cohorts aspired to share that ability with all peoples all over the world. And you well described that the the government of England 
No, no, no. They wanted a monopoly on that power. And in just those first 64 pages describing that, it's the genesis of the struggle, like you're describing, that we are still seeing That's today. Right. And and it's it's uh it's really, really uh satisfying to you know, someone like me who has spent my life scratching my head, you know, why are things the way they are? I'm I'm pretty well read about these kind of things. My guest is Anton Chaitkin, and I am Bruce Tatoris, and this is TNT Radio. You should hear what Charlie Robinson is talking about. What do you make of this insanity with Trump? This feels really weird to me. The whole thing, after all is said and done, does he come out of this looking like a martyr? I think so. I mean, the worst part for them, uh, whoever them are, is not only is this case ridiculous, but on top of that, don't forget, it's the Southern District in New York that's sitting on all the Epstein stuff. They haven't indicted anyone. They haven't even questioned Bill Clinton. We're at a place where it is um, just persecution, political persecution, and it looks bad to the rest of the world as much as it does us, while our military industrial complex and the Uniparty continue to instigate, I think, I believe, uh, wars all over the world and to me it's a bigger picture which is you know donald trump right now not only are they making him look better but there are millions and millions of people who have been wronged by our justice system people put in jail for white collar crimes or small crimes people especially in family court all over that are right now maybe never even like trump never voted for him never voted at all but are going to vote against the justice system and the corruption so i mean they're really backfiring here charlie robinson on today's news talk radio tnt Let's take advantage of the freedoms that we have while we have them to advance the kingdom's objective, to be salt and light. Freedom is hard. Election election security involves you, involves the voters. This election for people of faith is vital that we see a change because the war against Christians is at an all-time high. Transparency is the key not only to having uh, honest elections, but to maintaining public trust in those elections. Our ability to vote is not being um, withheld from us. No one's trying to stop you from voting. The one place the American people can have a say is at the ballot box. That's why the Democrats and, and the far left are working so hard to get rid of all election integrity. We cannot let our elections be uh, anything but transparent. Uh, it is at the very heart of freedom in a free society. And if we lose America, I mean, it's it's all over because the world has looked to America for hope. Free and fair at SalemNow.com. The conversation continues. I don't believe it, and I think that's a terrible position that I am in, that I don't trust my government. This is today's News Talk Radio, TNT. This is Bruce Tatars with me is Anton Chaitkin. Anton, before uh, reviewing... Lincoln and that era and Henry Carey, uh, the basic yeah. colonialism that the founders re- rebelled against was so heinous. And it's good to, you know, reteach people that the, the model was to not allow the 13 colonies to develop an industrial capacity to, to develop and use their own natural resources to, to do much manufacturing, if any manufacturing at all. And that, that is just such a you know, model for just total subjugation. And it's what you know, Britain went on to do around the, around the world, but just specifically the lie of free trade and the fight to uh, the struggle here in America as you say, to finally be able to unleash some manufacturing by the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Could you flesh that out just for a minute, just to, to, to verify what I just, you know, summarized and, yeah. the, you know, just the, the, real, the, the, the real abuse that inspired our revolution? Right. Well, the, the, our, uh, the generation that made the American Revolution was very well aware of the worldwide abuse of the British Empire and the other colonial empires, but Britain was in the lead, particularly looking at India as well as Ireland. In those countries, 
just like with the American colonies, the native manufacturing capabilities were destroyed and suppressed by the British. They had a racial attitude towards, it wasn't just non-whites, it was anybody that wasn't uh, in the families of the elite in London and, and uh, the other European centers. So the, it, there was real mass murder for decade after decade in those two countries, India and Ireland. So in the United States, they passed, in, in the American colonies, or before the revolution, the British passed laws that the Americans could not manufacture. They couldn't make uh, finished iron products. They couldn't make their own tools. They had to import finished goods from England and they had to export raw materials, uh, agricultural products, uh, later cotton became very important, and uh, things like iron that would be the, the uh, raw materials for British manufacturing. So this, the abuse was based on a hierarchical system. Now, there's a real uh, 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 paradox for Americans uh, uh, who consider themselves conservatives. Uh, supposing you have the idea that Anglo-Saxons are somehow better uh, and are somehow the basis for our system, that there's an Anglo-Saxon system. This is really stupid because the, Amer the Declaration of Independence was against this kind of a racial idea because the racial idea was directly opposed to our independence from Mother England, even though many of the people came here from England. Uh, so the Anglo-Saxon system uh, is just a British construct that gives us the Anglo-American elite of today. Now, there are other countries in our world at the moment, and I would name primarily Russia and China. You can put India in there and some other countries as well, but these are countries that want to do what America used to do and are doing it, which is to build up the power of production, the infrastructure, and the raising the level of skills for the world's population. That we were the we 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 used to do that. Edison brought electricity with his partners to the whole world. We were the ones who introduced uh, long uh, train systems to the world. We we introduced all these things when we played a different role in the world than we do now. Now we are against it. The last president to do that in the American tradition was was John F. Kennedy, and uh, he was murdered. For, for really for those reasons. Beef, beef, uh, quick tangent, you mentioned Russia and, and China and from Matthew Errett and, and rising, his Rising Ta Tide Foundation, um, learning a lot along the lines you just described about what Russia and China are aspiring to. How, and those countries' efforts along these lines, Anton, how... Are they simultaneously working or not for the personal human rights and freedoms of their people and the people that they're in other countries that they're working with? Well, uh, in every country that you could name, there are problems of uh, suppressing human rights in one way or another. Uh, you have a you have a one party system in China. You have a, uh, a, a terrible uh, security state uh, in every country that is subject to sanctions and the threat of war. And, and if you really look at, look at the American hemisphere, look at Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, leftist dictatorships, how would we want to change that? Or even look at Iran with the theocratic dictatorship, terrible uh, system. Uh, leave aside the aspirations of those countries to make progress. All countries have the same needs, but in, in a system that is threatened with war, 
that is subject to sanctions, that is bullied by a world globalist system, uh, you are you are forcing them more and more to into a superstitious and and uh, uh, self protective. Uh, 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 kind of uh, dictatorship. If you want to change that, if you want to emphasize human rights, the way you have to go is adopt a friendship with those countries, share projects, and also put the United States into the lead in industry and technology and infrastructure. If we build up our power, our real power, I don't mean the power to end civilization with nuclear weapons. I'm talking about the power to to become the world's greatest industrial and scientific and skilled country. We have many people who, who, who have no skills at all now in the United States. But if we become powerful in that way, with the mm -hmm. theme, with the theme that we have joint problems like Kennedy pursued with his joint nuclear projects for desalination desalination that was his way of ending the problems in the middle east and and elsewhere joint projects mm -hmm. joint space program that's the way to address the actual issues of human rights if you really want the hardliners to back off you have to encourage yeah. people who are part of world uh you know cooperation to make progress. Globalism is I, the opposite to that. It's simply war. Absolutely. And maybe the test, if some, you know, you are an American, if you really believe that all people are created equal and have a right to develop their talents right. and to have this kind of freedom, I'm reminded from just the first 64 pages of your book, Who We Are, Volume 1, of... Ben Franklin and his cohorts in England who developed these breakthroughs in manufacturing, these English men, Franklin got them over to France to develop, brought that technology to France so that France could, as quickly as possible, build up their ability to make the, the arms and ammunition, the cannons that could help the United States win the revolution they seem to be an example of the kind of people you're describing who would want first their own countries to become robust and self-sufficient and uh, along these lines while helping every other country become similarly robust, self-sufficient, wealthy uh, until we're on a planet where everyone's got the right to do this. And you can do that if you're an American by the definition of you believe all people are endowed with certain inalienable rights and are created equal right but not to impose this by force and and this goes to some of the issues that i i wanted to get into with the with the reconstruction era it, it involves the rights of the black people the rights of mm -hmm. the indians how could these things be addressed and still advance the civilization that the united states was was promoting and that's that's crucial to for people to understand uh, at the at the end of the Civil War, the South was in ruins, and the old uh, oligarchs were out of power. The U.S. Army was occupying the South, and there were the, the the crucial division in American politics was inside the Republican Party. There were two wings of the Republican Party. One of them based in Philadelphia, the Nationalists and one of them based in New York and Boston, people allied with Britain. And there were two pressing issues at that time. One of them was what to do about the South, and the other was what to do about the US economy, whether to develop it with high tariffs and with ample federal currency, the greenbacks. Uh, on uh, in the in the Northeast, the people allied with Britain, and they were joining British groups. They were part of actual British groups called the Cobden Club, the Free Trade League, and others. The British were running this new establishment in the Northeast, linked up with financiers up there. Uh, so these people believed in free trade. 
that no country has the right to deliberately promote industry by high tariffs and by cheap, uh, you know, government uh, 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 cheap credit and 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 uh, paper money that the government backs by promoting industry, so that you've got a lot of production, you don't get inflation. The nationalists, Anton, Anton, yeah. Anton, teach for a second the the lie of free trade. How, because like many modern folks, I instantly think, oh, that's a that's a good thing, but that's that's a deception. You want free trade within your country, but not, but n- don't allow some foreign monopoly where they ha- they control uh, the the advanced production. Don't allow them to flood your country with cheap imports so that you can't build up manufacturing. Uh, you can see the reality of this by these Philadelphia industrialists. Here are people, the 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 leaders of the Pennsylvania Railroad were the people who organized the American steel industry from the begin from scratch. There were no steel mills. And in 1865, six and seven, they set up they and their immediate allies set up the first American steel mills. Now they needed high tariffs to stop the flooding of the country with cheap British imports. Mainly they were dealing with rails for the for the railroads. Uh, the same people built our first, uh, built up the uh, petroleum industry. It wasn't Rockefeller. It was these people. It was the nationalists. The same people were building up the West in Colorado and other places. The Transcontinental Railroad was a nationalist project, but it was it was compromised by the Northeastern financiers got their hooks into it. But these are the people building the country. Now, they also wanted to change the South. These were the radicals in the South. They were the industrialists from Philadelphia. Uh, uh, Stevens, Thaddeus Stevens was one of their congressmen from Pennsylvania. He was for high tariffs and easy money. He was for building industry in the South and for taking the land away from the old land barons, the aristocracy, and giving that land to the blacks in the South while we are also building up industry and railroads. That was, the pro- that was the program. The Pennsylvania Railroad went into the South and with the, uh, with the actual endorsement of old Southern leaders, white leaders, were building up railroads in the South. They wanted to industrialize the South. They wanted to have high tariffs maintained in the whole country and change the South so that it would be modern, no more cotton empires. How about industry? How about cities? How about railroads north-south that would connect the south to the rest of the country so that they would not have this old attitude? If you have skilled work and bring in people from the north and bring in people from the west and have the southerners be able to go to those other places and have white and black workers in demand, because there's new industries that need workers desperately and they'll pay higher wages. That changes the whole Southern system, doesn't it? It changes. It does. And so this was squashed and it, by the Morgan mm-hmm. interests and squashed by the British. And I'm, uh, and you these, know, you can, and these nationalists, these this. nationalists among them was Henry Carey. He was still among them, right? Yes. Henry Carey, the son of Matthew Carey, who I discussed, he was one of the, uh, one of the American founders, uh, Henry Carey wrote. He was the advisor to Lincoln and the Republican Party. Uh, he wrote. He was the most important uh, economist in the in the in the 19th century, and he and wrote literally a son time. of right, and because he was, they were literally mindful of and trying to implement the ideas of the Ben American Franklin Republican. and the other the other right, and the right. other yeah. nationalists yeah. back then. Thank you. Yeah, Franklin. The Franklin legacy was in was there in Philadelphia. So Henry Carey wrote in the period after the Civil War, wrote to Grant and others, uh, and and he was against Andrew Johnson, who who was falsely claimed the, the North was being cruel to the South. It's total baloney. Henry Carey said we have to help the South by building North South railroads, by having land reform 
so that the people, the small people of the South have their own family farms. They So that there wasn't any much private property in the South. It was mainly these huge estates. So family farms by land reform, you need a military government there to start with because these guys with the help of uh, terrorist organizations are not going to allow the changes. The South itself will be favorable to this change. Most, almost all of them, except for these old British connected crazies. And Anton. we need railroads and we need industry. Yeah. That was the program. And, and that was what they fought for. If that was done, My, then, yeah. then FDR and Kennedy would not have to put up with the Southern uh, right. so-called Southern attitudes uh, and, uh, and right. That we would, that's what we need to do in the, in, in Latin America today. And, and that's how to I guess solve the might, immigration problem. Thank you. My guest is Anton Chaitkin and this is TNT radio. With his expert analysis and opinion, this is TNT Radio's Timothy Shea. If you need further proof that we live in a clown world with a two-tier system of justice, look no further than the case of Jack Teixeira, the 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guardsman who has been arrested by G-men LARPing as special operators. Why isn't Teixeira being hailed as the whistleblower he is, like Alexander Vindman? and Eric Ciaramella were? Why? Because he's not favoring the dominant narrative. He's not supporting the current thing. He's not the darling of the left because he actually was trying to stop them. And if you try to stop the regime, it will crush you under its boot heel. From MAGAinstitute.com, this is Timothy Shea for TNT Radio. Are you finding it harder to do the things you used to do? like vacuuming or getting to appointments. If you need a bit of support at home, the Australian Government's My Aged Care is your starting point to access services. You'll find all the information and advice you need in the one place. To find out about other services, eligibility and costs, call 1800 200 422 or go to myagedcare.gov.au. Authorised by the Australian Government, Canberra, spoken by Heather Christie. You're listening to Bruce DeTorres on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. With us is historian and investigative journalist Anton Chaitkin. And also, Anton, because Lincoln is a great door to many Americans to the history of this era, what you're describing is what was known then and what we need to relearn now, I believe, the American that's right. system, that's right. Just yeah, for a uh, mental note for folks when they see that in books and other histories and your hundreds of articles over the decades, uh, it's the American system, yeah. Yeah, that was Lincoln's lifelong uh, uh, passion to, to improve the condition of men by uh, having a, a new transportation, the, the railroads and canals, all of that involved government backing. The government wasn't going to own the industries. They weren't going to own your house. They weren't going to own your cities. But they had to play a role to protect the ability of the country to do these things by, by helping develop the, the, the transportation they, they, he was for the National Bank, and uh, during the Civil War, uh, a, a new form of that, uh, just national banking, that would uh, set up a situation where, where there's credit that's going towards developing the country, not simply making bets and having uh, mm. financiers who are international to do things that is against the the, the welfare of the country. Uh, and you he just... Was, mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. No, you. Well, I, I, if you described, you were, you were in the middle of describing this alternate history we could have had in the South had the nationalists, yes. um, you know, pick that, pick that up if you want, or go off on what, you know, you were just talking about. Yeah. I'd like to, we had this, we had part of the, part of the program by these uh, nationalists in Philadelphia was to impeach the president 
uh, Andrew Johnson because of his he was the one that got he came in after the you know as president he had been vice president under Lincoln for only for a couple of months and for a second term and when he came in he immediately uh began to encourage the old rebel leaders the old aristocrats of the south to resist uh the the congress and the laws and to take power again and he he was for free trade he had a guy named McCulloch as the treasury secretary and this was part of the british system remember the south exported cotton to England. That's where most of it went. And most of their cotton came from the slave South. They have a lot of baloney about how Britain was against uh, slavery and racism. That's That was the world center of it, even if they didn't allow it inside of England. So uh, we, we, we the only way to solve the problem in the South was to change the entire imperial dominated system of the old days and if you look at today the different places in the world where we have for example why do people run away migrate in waves by the millions from south america latin america from the middle east and from war-torn areas because Hmm. they are subject to what i i would say anglo-american policy of constant war, sanctions, and and other forms of chaos and violence, including allowing the drug pushers to have uh, the uh, the banks that they deposit their money in the offshore system. So, if we, how would you solve that? Now, Republicans and Democrats are on opposite sides of of so called favoring the the migrants. Democrats say they're for them, and Republicans say they're against them. Well, neither side addresses the problem. Why shouldn't we change the life of the people in the countries where they are? We are the ones, our system is the the system that's imposing the chaos and the violence. Why don't we make some deals for mutual benefit development of Latin America? Like uh, China's starting to do that. If we're worried about China, why don't we do the same? Why don't we go in uh, and and make some deals with the countries of Central and South America to build mm. nuclear power plants, modern ports, new cities, steel mills, uh, great schools and universities? Why don't we build up these areas, not by a force, not by imposing our way of life, but, but simply by saying, here's a deal. What do you think about this? Like, like the isn't, space is supposed to be. That's what we right. should have and done it, with the Indians. We took away their way of life by building the railroad through their buffalo herds. How about if, but we never offered them a new way of life, did we? We didn't really no. give them the hand of friendship to say, look, here's some mining properties. Here's some uh, agricultural properties that are really good. Here's some, the the kind of help you need in science and other m- means, because we were responsible for, for laying them low. So let's give, but it, I believe it was a good thing that the our civilization expanded. But you can't do these things simply by force. You have to you offer them and friendship and bring them in yeah. and say, look, we wronged you. Can't you. Be. So we had a crime here. Let's let's yeah. make have peace, but on the basis of your progress, not just and our, you asked, our Right. And you asked this series, like, why don't we do this, that and the other really, really good thing? And Anton, I'm learning from you and my other research. It's because somewhere along the line after reconstruction and except for the anomalous president or two or three who worked for these kind of things. America has been co-opted again by the whole British imperial model. That's pretty fair, right? Morgan, Morgan came in. Uh, he, he was he's the, the Morgan firm was first set up from London by his father, Junius Morgan, a London banker, with the backing of the royal family. They set up a 
firm in Philadelphia in 1872. It's called Drexel Morgan. They went to war against these nationalists, and they they particularly warred against Jay Cook and the Northern Pacific Railroad. It's a whole story, but they they bankrupted these nationalists by breaking down the system. They crashed the whole system in 1873, uh, and this this put a terrible uh, weakening on these nationalists. Rockefeller came in, backed by these same British and, and high society people in New York and Boston. Uh, Rockefeller took over the oil industry and crushed Tom Scott and the Pennsylvania Railroad, got them out of the, uh, the, the, uh, the oil industry and, and got a monopoly. But Morgan took over all the industries that had built, been built up by these nationalists, by Americans. And this was an international financial cabal. And, and they, people understood those things in that time. That's not a conspiracy theory. It's simply the power structure in the world. The power structure has to do with uh, sovereign nations and their rise versus the empire, the imperial system. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt got, got in power by the assassination of McKinley, who was the last American system president. Teddy Roosevelt's uncle was a was a uh, the head of the Secret Service uh, for the Confederacy over in England. His name was James Bullock, very famous guy. He wrote lots of books mm. about it. So Teddy Roosevelt and this uncle worked together on trying to falsify and cover up what what was done by the Confederates and the British together, which included his uncle sending the money up to Canada to finance the Booth team that came out of. Canada to assassinate Lincoln. So then, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Teddy Roosevelt took power himself by the assassination of uh, McKinley by an anarchist network that that was really centered in London. Again, these are really the anarchists of the day. Uh, and terrorists in of various kinds today are imperial stooges, and uh, you, they, they believe in they believe in backwardness yeah. for the world. Anton, I see. You know the the modern since World War II and the monetary policies, and you know represented by John Perkins, uh, you know Confessions of an Economic Hitman. In our in our last few minutes here discuss the state of the country and the world and what we should think about it and try to teach each other and demand from our uh, candidates and elected officials that can turn the ship around. Okay, this can never be done simply by uh, complaining or attacking evil directly. You have to stand up to it, but but people have to concentrate on solving problems of mankind, the problems and, and of the United States. We have to increase the power that people have over nature, the power that people have by associating in, in, in modern conditions, modern industry, to build up the engineering, the science, and the, and the skills of our country and other countries. We have to do this cooperatively. You have to focus on the solutions. If you mm -hmm. don't do that, you are headed towards nuclear war because these other countries are doing that now. And if the only way to stop them from doing it is to obliterate the whole planet. So if you want mm -hmm. to save civilization, you have to concentrate on building up right. the United States, not on some stupid fight about pe some people, crazy people changing their sex. Don't get right. into that. Right. You've got to focus right. on, on mankind's power to, to survive and to flourish in, in, into yeah. the future by having power to develop uh, all of the people in the, in the world, ourselves and other countries, we have this a common interest. You know, all, it's only the crazy, some crazy group like ISIS, you know, people on drugs yeah. that are our enemies. Every other country has the same needs that we do. Do you did you encounter much of a nineteenth century economist Henry George? And he's a discovery to me in the last year. And I'm involved with 
my publishing company, I do marketing for Trine Day with an effort to publicize this brand new open letter to King Charles III in time for his coronation that wants to continue teaching another suppressed part of history, which is the economics of Henry George, the Georgia School of Economics. Is that familiar to you at all? It is, and I, I think it's a, a distraction. I really do. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, King Charles is widely known for talking to plants, but he doesn't talk to human beings. He doesn't, he doesn't look at, he doesn't look at the needs of the world, which are industrial, which are scientific in the sense of increasing the, for example, increasing the heat of a furnace to many thousands of degrees that you get with nuclear power and with fusion the kind of things that you need for rockets that are going to get you to do serious space travel. We're talking about the needs of human beings, which cannot be solved by soft energy. Mm. Can, you, mm -hmm. you have to, we don't want to violate nature. We want to have beautiful cities like some of these uh, people back that I'm writing about built up Colorado Springs and other places in a beautiful setting but we should have had millions of people in the Mountain West. We never developed yeah. those places. We've got to focus Ooh. on this kind of powerful uh, uh, industrial civilization for mankind, high-speed trains, space program. That's the future for mankind, not uh, you know the rights of rhinoceroses. I'm sorry. I'm awful well, sorry. Uh, but no, but right. and also, like, wouldn't wouldn't focusing on those things be either hand in hand, or wouldn't they follow clarifying for oneself? I want I want to live and prosper, and I want everyone to live and prosper. It's a holistic idea, you know. Like, no, I can't. No one country. I would say no one person. Yeah, we all have to wake up to. My country is facilitating barbarism and, and brutality and, and oh. destruction and domination and exploitation and literally crimes against other countries. Like, first of all, we have to we would have to make America orient itself towards life and the enjoyment of life for all. And then how That's does that right. get implemented? It's by solving the problems along the lines you are describing. And I would put the but, family into this. The American family at its best is a productive family that is for multiple generations who are privileged to work in modern conditions with modern skills. That, mm. that it's not simply morality that is an abstract or a religious idea. You have to be able to work successfully and support a family. And if we could have that kind of family oriented mm. idea, that's a contribution of America to the rest of the world. Yeah. And we could talk incredibly about the despair and the alienation and just the, the damage done by the psychological warfare along all kinds of lines to destroy uh, a sense of family, if not a sense of, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm safe on this planet. I'm safe in this universe. It's a benevolent universe, and I've got capabilities. I'm, I'm capable for life. I can solve my own problems. I can. We could diagnose these problems in many angles. Yep, when, that's right. When do you when do you guess volume two of Who We Are by Anton Chaikin <laughs> might come out? <laughs> Well, I'm working as hard as I can. I've written about 250 pages. Uh, I'm in chapter eight right now out of about 13. And uh, I, I'm working under, you know, somewhat difficult circumstances. But uh, uh, I, I hope to get the book, the second volume out this year. And uh, I, I want to make it uh, as uh, as uh, exciting and interesting with new discoveries. I'm committed to having all new discoveries about the fundamental issues and problems of history, not some side issue, even however <laughs> interesting those are. It has to be about the center of history. So that takes what's a the, while. What's the history of health and longevity in your uh, family, Anton? <laughs> Well, my father unfortunately died when he was uh, about 57, 
but the, the my wife and I are both had our 80th birthday and really the what what keeps you going is having fun uh, doing some some important work you know that that's that uh, I'd recommend I'm, that to anybody I am drooling for volume 2 and for volume 3 man we my to my to my listener out there my listeners um Anton Chaitkin has been my guest and you can learn about his current book and uh, about him and his past work also at Get in touch who with we me. are book who who we are book.com and where else that's good you can just all just right get in touch yeah. with me through that amen do you have a sub stack anton no I, sh- I probably should right well no i want you to finish volume two We've got to go, (laughs) and we'll be back soon, and this is TNT Radio.